search goes on in San Francisco for the man known as the Zodiac Killer. The psychotic killer has already murdered five. He claims that uh, he's murdered 13 individuals. Of course, as our records uh, reflect five. Uh... The Zodiac Killer seems to crave publicity. He sent letters and cryptograms to newspapers and the police. Police are now convinced that it was the killer of a San Francisco cab driver who sent in a swatch of bloody cloth with a letter to the San Francisco Chronicle. This guy is a pathological uh, psycho uh, killer. How long have you had those headaches, uh, Sam? Since I killed a kid. School children make fine targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning just shoot out the front tire and then pick off the kiddies as they come bouncing out. We have no uh, known motive at this time, however, we're not overruling any possibility. How about leads? We have several leads that we're working on and uh, some of them have uh, been expired. We have uh, ruled them out. No, we're just about in the same position. We're still following a tremendous amount of leads. Uh, we're getting a tremendous amount of information every day, not only from the Bay Area, but from all over the nation. Uh. The murders terrorized the Bay Area decades ago, and the killer taunted police by sending letters to the media. But now a team of independent investigators says it has identified the Zodiac Killer. I also killed those kids last year. Can we put a um, documentary filmmaker instead of YouTuber, unless one of you guys can think of something more pretentious? The Zodiac case was one of the earlier cases at a time that was rife with serial killers in the USA. Between the 1960s and early 80s, there was a multitude of serial killers. By a killer who's become known as the Night Stalker. A killer the police are calling the Hillside Strangler design or intent to affect the death of said Lisa Lee. This is where they lived, among the stables, barns, and phony buildings of an old rundown movie location 20 miles from Los Angeles. Has had three of its followers arrested in the investigation of the murder of Sharon Tate and six others. Well, he said, you got me. Police say those words ended the biggest manhunt in New York City history with the capture of Son of Sam. More bodies unearthed from the basement crawl space of Gacy's Norwood Park Township home today, bringing to 15 the number found there since Friday. I'm called the banana, and I look really good. And there was obviously serial killers outside of that time frame but there was very much a, a grouping of them around that time. And specifically in California, it was a wash with serial killers. And there was a few reasons for this, all of which added up to the key reason, and that was the fact that it was just easier to get away with murder. Big city police rejected evidence from small town cops like Harvey Hines, and police rivalries hampered the Zodiac investigation of possibly 30 murders all over the state. It wasn't handled as you would handle it today, uh, because I don't think there was the experience there to actually handle it that way. And under today's circumstances, because of the technology we have today that we didn't have then, they would have worked that crime scene for 24 hours. I mean, they would have taken earth samples, uh, they would have looked for fiber, you would have looked for follic hairs, any hair. I mean, it would have been a lot more in depth just because they had the technology that today that we, they did not have in those days. The interdepartmental politics where police would be fighting that a case is theirs and a case is someone else's, along with the fact that DNA evidence just didn't exist and forensics in general was nowhere near what it is today, just made it a lot easier um, for people to get away with murder back then. And serial killers thrived in that environment. And the Zodiac Killer was one of the most famous and it got more and more famous as each year where it was unsolved went by. Between 1968 and 1987, someone calling himself the Zodiac claimed responsibility for up to 40 murders. And he left behind a trail of bodies and taunting letters. Then suddenly the murder stopped and he went silent. There was something about this case that was different. And it became, uh, I think, a battle, you know, a chess game between the killer and, and uh, people like uh, Captain Narlow of Napa who were... Uh, highly intelligent police officers who really did their best. And if you watch the 2007 movie, Zodiac, with Mark Ruffalo, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, you would be forgiven for assuming 
um, that this case was solved. But it couldn't be further from the truth. Well, you can't leave me here all alone by myself. I'm helpless. What if a burglar broke in? And you know, they never did catch that Zodiac killer. Officially, it, it, it remains unsolved. Yes. Are people going to be dissatisfied with, I don't want to give them the full ending of the movie away, but dissatisfied with, with the ending? Why has he not been caught? Extremely intelligent. Uh, this man has crafted uh, ciphers that have never been broken to this day. Uh, a certain amount of luck involved, too. And he's highly skilled. He, he's skilled in explosives, uh, cryptography, uh, any type of weapons. Even a bullets. master criminal? A master criminal and uncaught to this day. We still get calls almost daily from people who believe they know who the Zodiac is. And I think part of its fame as well was definitely helped by the fact that the lead detective on the case was this rock star detective. For the last nine years, the Zodiac investigation has been headed by homicide inspector David Tusky. A yeah, San Francisco homicide detective and the model for the Dirty Harry movies vowed to catch the Zodiac, but he never did. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? I have always felt uh, a gut feeling that, that he was not dead and that he was out there somewhere and that he would communicate. And every man and his dog thought that their father or their dog did it. Um, but this case remained unsolved for a very long time. Now though, it seems like we are closer than ever to getting a final answer on who the Zodiac is. But to really understand how, why and who, we need to first go back to where it all begins. I heard you paint houses. Yes, yes, sir, I, I do. The first murders in this case took place in a very quiet and small town in California called Benicia. The population was probably around 5,000. It was a sleepy little community, middle class. Crime rate was very, very low. The first killings and the enduring mystery begin not far from San Francisco. It is late one night, five days before Christmas. In December of 1968, David Faraday took Betty Lou Jensen out on their first date. The two high school students made a fateful choice that night. They went to park in the secluded hills around Benicia, California. When headlights appear out of the darkness, the car stops behind them. A man emerged and began blasting a handgun into the driver's door of Faraday's car. We heard the Benicia Police Department dispatcher put out a call of possible shooting and victims on Lake Herman Road and described the location. Uh, my partner and I turned around at that time and responded to the call. Sergeant, could you briefly describe what apparently happened last night? Yes, we had a double homicide that took place out on a county road about uh, sometime after 11 o'clock last night. A double homicide involving victims were a 16-year-old girl and a 17-year-old boy. What were the circumstances involved? Possibly they were ordered out of the car by the responsible. Forcing the two kids out of the passenger side. The boy was shot right at the side of the car and the girl apparently tried to run and she was shot and found 28 feet further on. There was one bullet hole that penetrated one of the windows of the car. Uh, was this a, a stray bullet or was this one of the bullets that uh, hit the victim and went on through? This could be a, a stray bullet or uh, a warning bullet of some sort. It, uh, we can't connect it with the bodies, but it's the same type of shell. He reached his gun through the window and shot David as he exited. And Betty Lou was running toward Benicia. Uh, when he shot her some 26 feet away, uh, five times. He shoots David Faraday as he tries to escape through that door. Betty Lou Jensen is hit with the light beam and the bullets as she runs toward the road. This was a particularly brutal murder. The killer placed the gun right up against David's skull for the last shot. And then as Betty Lou started running as fast as she could away from um, the killer, he fired several shots into her back in a, in a very, very close pattern. Whoever did this was clearly a marksman. They knew how to use a gun. 
frightening because it's such a random act, and frustrating because the hunt for the killer turns up nothing. Obviously, given the fact that there was no known related killings at the time, uh, the police were a little bit dumbstruck by what the motive could be for this. Do you have any idea what uh, the possible motive might be for this killing? We have no motive at this time. And within a few days, a picture started to form that this could be drugs related, which was at first thrown out because he, Betty Lou and, and David didn't even drink. But there was then a report um, that came to the attention of the police that David had threatened someone who was pushing drugs uh, in the local area. This execution style double homicide took place in Vallejo right at the peak of this wave of violent drug dealing and trafficking by biker gangs. During that night, we had served a search warrant at the what we called the cottage at Lake Herman, which was owned by the city of Benicia, a narcotic search warrant, my partner and I. And we, have con we confiscated about a pound and a half of marijuana, which, you know, in the 1960s, that was a big drug bust. Today, it uh, wouldn't get very high on the Richter scale. David Faraday was an Eagle Scout. He received a God and Country Award from the Boy Scouts, one of the highest awards you can receive in the Boy Scouts. He was on the wrestling team. According to the police reports, witnesses told investigators that a couple of days before he was murdered, that David got into a physical altercation, almost a knockdown, drag out fight with this young punk from his high school at the Pancake House on Tennessee Street. David said, you're pushing drugs at my school and I'm gonna put a stop to it. So for the first while after the murder, this is where the police were looking, but that would change. Uh, I think that the FBI statistics are still somewhere in the high 80s that most victims know their assailant. The next murders took place in Vallejo uh, at a place called Blue Rock Springs, which was only about a six or seven minute drive from Lake Herman Road where the first murders took place. Again, another fairly quiet, fairly small and peaceful place. We never had too many murders. We solved them all, but there was just a few. Darlene Farina, 22-year-old waitress, was the next victim. She lived nearby in Vallejo, California, and had gone out with her friend Mike McGough on the night of July 4th, 1969. They were cruising around Vallejo when a car chased them out of town and cornered. We were chased by this guy, chased by him from a restaurant. He was chasing us, and I told him to pull off of the park. And he chased me all night long at the restaurant, he chased us to a, a coffee shop named Paul's, or whatever it was called, and then, uh, then he chased us all the way to the park, and then we, that's where I ended up in Blue Rock Springs Park. I thought he drove off, drove away, but he came back later on. And, and this guy pulled up beside them. Uh, Darlene and Mike looked across at him, and apparently Darlene knew uh, who this guy was that was chasing them. 22-year-old Darlene Farron and 19-year-old Mike Majot believe the man approaching their car is a policeman. And then suddenly the door flings open and this crew-cutted man with glasses, a rather pronounced stomach, uh, gets out shining a light into their eyes. They're totally blinded. And Mike had reached for his wallet almost as if he thought it was some sort of policeman. And he fired bullets into the car. And the bullets uh, passed through Mike, who was very badly wounded. Uh, he had extensive surgery, but Darlene was killed. Uh, he survived. Mike McGough uh, miraculously survived. Darlene was shot several times, much more than Michael Majot. Like this person really wanted Darlene death. This was a pretty brutal murder once again. Um, and most of the bullets were pumped into Darlene. Um, Mike obviously took a few pretty brutal shots, but it seemed like the killer was very focused on Darlene. At least that was what the police and, and what the reports would say at the time. And uh, he asked Darlene, do you know who that is? And she said something like, never mind. And the fact is as well that Darlene had been uh, saying to people, including her sister, um, that there was someone who she was afraid of, um, someone who basically she apparently had witnessed do something before. She said that she seen him do something. She seen him kill someone. She never mentioned his name, but she said something about Richard. 
I was like, oh, his name was Richard. I remember his name Richard. So the initial thoughts were that someone clearly knew the victim um, because of, of how brutal it was, particularly to Darlene. For example, she was out with Mike while her husband was uh, apparently at home with the kids at the time. Um, you know, and Mike has said that he was her boyfriend at the time. She liked to go out and, and dance and I work nights and it got back to me and they're, oh, she's out here whoring around and I don't believe that. And some of the other, her closer friends said that wasn't true. They're just a group of girls going out. So there was a lot of intrigue around this idea that it was someone that Darlene knew um, that was chasing them. And the police officer angle was quite interesting. This was one that was put forward um, very much by, I think, Graysmith in his book at one point. Um, and that was an interesting one for a few reasons, not least the fact that uh, Mike has admitted in his testimony that they thought it was a police officer behind them, the way the car parked behind them apparently was quite like a police officer. And another part of that theory that would make you think that perhaps this guy has some sort of inside with the police or is police is um, that according to Mike in Graysmith's book, um, the door handle on Graysmith's on the passenger side was removed and he couldn't actually get out of the car until the Zodiac opened the door to shoot him. But in the police reports, that door handle was then back, which would mean someone who had access to the crime scene, if that is to be believed. Gray Smith wrote a book about the Zodiac, and he, he mentioned in his book that I was at her, Darlene, and her husband's house on a house painting party prior to her death, and I, I don't know anything about that. It wasn't me. And uh, the officer, I think it was Dick Hoffman, a uh, patrol officer, got there first and said he had a shooting. So I took that in the purse and those things were all put into evidence. When the ambulance left, we uh, told Hoffman to ride in the ambulance and keep trying to get a statement. Both of them uh, were put in the ambulance and I rode the ambulance with them. You knew her before the attack, right? I never laid eyes on her. Never laid eyes on her before the no, no, I'd heard that she was a waitress at uh, an all-night restaurant uh, in Vallejo, but I, I, I didn't know the girl at all. Initially, there was obviously the thought that this was someone she knew. Some of those roads would have pointed, for obvious reasons, to her ex-husband, but there is a variety of other people that could have been involved. Um, Darlene definitely was afraid of, of someone. If it's true that Darlene is targeted by a very personal motive, the first person who comes to mind would be the ex-husband, and this particular ex-husband does have a criminal record. When I first met, she was still married and having a little trouble with her husband and wanted to get out from under him. They lived in a motel on the edge of town, and he wouldn't let her sleep in the bed and slapped around a little bit. He owned a car just like the one described by Mike. He was known to be stalking Darlene. In my opinion, Darlene Farron's ex-husband, Jim, is the prime suspect in her murder. He seemed very capable of doing something like this. He was that strange. He was definitely a, a weirdo. All of those thoughts and ideas, though, quickly went out the window after one terrifying phone call. Then the next call I got was about 12.40. Vallejo Police Department. I want to report a double murder. May I have your you name? Go one mile east calling? on Columbus Parkway, public park. Go find kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9 millimeter Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Good. Bye. Of course, I immediately call for an ID man uh, to, to go to the phone booth and preserve whatever evidence was possible. And he spent quite a few hours there and recovered literally uh, dozens and dozens of fingerprints that uh, have not been identified to this day. Some of them were so fresh that he had to, to uh, artificially dry them so that he could lift the print because it was too moist.
Then the case's most famous signature would be introduced. The killer now sent letters to two newspapers, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Examiner, and the Vallejo Times Herald. They were the beginning of a flood of written evidence he would pour forth for years to come. He gave himself a name, Zodiac. Doing such things as describing what the, uh, the woman was wearing, uh, you know, enough details to tell the police that, the, that he was the man. Ages or else. If you do not print this cipher, I will cruise around all weekend killing lonely people in the night until I end up with a dozen. And what did that do to this community? It terrified everyone. Three newspapers gave their front pages to this man. I mean, that's how terrified they were. In this particular code, the Zodiac used what we refer to as a common letter numeral substitution code where you might substitute the letter uh, C for E and A for B and et cetera, and et cetera. And uh, coupled with that, he used uh, some symbols that you might describe as being uh, something like semaphore flags, where he'd take a square and color in half of it diagonally. Or uh, he used some Greek uh, symbols. The published codes stumped hundreds of amateur cryptographers and several intelligence agencies. Police, the CIA, a variety of law enforcement and governmental offices tried to break the cipher um, that was given with these letters. But it was solved by an unlikely couple, um, a husband and wife, who were teachers uh, in San Francisco. And finally, Donald Harden and his wife, who just simply sat down and through sheer stick to itiveness, worked around the clock. And they were the only ones, the CIA, uh, Naval Intelligence, none of these people were able to crack this three cipher code. And this was certainly for his wife, the very first attempt at any sort of cryptography. For Don Harden, uh, I think he'd done crossword puzzles. He had some various books on cipher. But what they had begun to do is they looked for a double combination of symbols, the most common being a double L. And Mrs. Harden thought that he would use the word kill. And so once they figured the word killing or kill was somewhere, and those were double L's that they were seeing throughout these ciphers, that eventually gave them the key uh, to, to break it. I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest, because man is the most dangerous animal of all. There's an interesting piece in the cipher, which is about um, humans being the most dangerous animal of all, which is a quote from The Dangerous Game. And this definitely stood out to police officers and got them a little bit worried because at the end of the day, that is a movie about a man who hunts humans, um, basically for sport. So a little bit worrying that. I'm going to be hunted. No, 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 Miss Trowbridge. Outdoor chess. His brain against mine. His woodcraft against mine. Only after the kill does man know the true ecstasy of love. Even with these letters, though, police essentially had nothing. The status of the case is just about as it was. We're getting many, many letters and telephone calls and everything. There's no no specific person that we suspect at this time. And it was about to get much, much worse. Hi, B. <laughs> Napa's kind of a secluded uh, community. We're bordered on both sides by major uh, highways, Highway 80, to our east and uh, Highway 101 to our west. And so we don't get a lot of the traffic coming through Napa that some of the other cities do. So we have a relatively uh, low crime rate. We can sometimes Ready? go several years without a homicide. <laughs> Look what I got for our favorite girl. Mother oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, I think that particular year we had five or six, which which is unusual. There's a lot of activity up in Berryessa during the summer months, but after Labor Day, when all the kids go back to school, it, it kind of quiets down. And this was September 27th, probably uh, three and a half weeks after Labor Day. So it was a very, very quiet uh, Saturday evening up there. The weather was nice. September 27th, 1969. For his new role of executioner, Zodiac chooses a peaceful setting in the heart of California's wine country. Celia Shepard and Brian Hartnell, both in their early 20s, were sitting on this knoll of land overlooking part of Lake Berryessa. They thought they were alone, but there was a third man on this knoll, a man who wore a medieval-style executioner's hood, carried a knife and gun, and intended to use them. 
they were approximately a quarter of a mile from the road uh, down near the uh, water front. And uh, they were laying out on a blanket uh, talking. They were schoolmates. And uh, the subject approached them. Uh, they saw uh, the subject come up by them. I happened to hear some uh, rustling in behind us, and I asked her to look because she was facing that direction. I was facing toward the water. And I asked her uh, to note you know, what was going on, and she said, oh, there's a man walking around there, and she became concerned about it, and I said, well, you know, actually, don't worry about it, it's some, there's a lot of people, picnickers, etc. and just, you know, if he kept coming, uh, let me know, and uh, she kind of kept watching, I noticed she wasn't following my conversation, and she told me he was stepping behind a tree, and the tree was about 30 feet behind us, and when he came out, she said, he's got a mask on, and that was my first inkling that there was anything actually wrong going on. They didn't think too much about it, and the next thing they knew, the subject was upon them uh, with a gun and uh, demanded the keys to uh, the car and uh, money. And I actually laughed at the moment because I, I told him, I said, I've only got 75 cents in my pocket, and I said, you're welcome to have it. I considered him a robber. I had absolutely no thought uh, that he was anything but that. And when we were at this robbery stage, I didn't consider any real threat to my life or to, or to the girl or anything. I really didn't consider this, but I, I really wanted to help him. He pulled for some uh, cuts of uh, three foot lengths of uh, clothesline. It, it's actually plastic. It's the kind that uh, is hollow in the center. The young man uh, stated that, well, you can have my money. I've only got a few cents, 75 or 80 cents. And with this, he says, well, I'm going to tie you up. And uh, he had the young lady tie uh, her friend up. And then he tied the, the girl up. He said, well, what I need right now is to get you tied up. And so uh, he had the girl tie me. And of course, she was real nervous and tied me rather loosely. And uh, he came, and he tightened the knots up. And then he tied her up. And uh, we continued the dialogue along most of this time. And the kid said, the money's in my pocket. He said, I don't want the money, all I want to do is kill you. The boy asked him, said, you really mean that? And he said, yes, I mean it. He says, um, well, he said, if you're going to said, kill me first, because I can't stand to see the girl be stabbed. He said, well, I'll do that. So he started stabbing the kid in the back. And laid him face down. And with this, he uh, proceeded to uh, knife both of them numerous times. Still on his knees, the man gave a ghastly frenzied sound and letting out a long, low exhalation, began stabbing the girl in the back. Ten times the knife fell. Instinctively, Cecilia rolled over on her back and the dark hunter continued thrusting. Once he plunged the knife full length into her chest, sated at last, the stocky man stood up and tossed the money and keys onto the blanket next to his victims. He walked slowly across the open peninsula and was soon lost in the empty twilight. Brian will probably be able to leave Queen of the Valley Hospital fairly soon. But where he's going from here is being kept secret in the event that the man who attacked him and killed Cecilia Shepard on Lake Berryessa a week ago Saturday tries again. Brian made it for two reasons some people might regard as intangibles, but reasons that for him were enough a strong faith and an equally strong will to live. I, I got to, was able to untie one of her hands, but she was too weak to untie me at that time. Finally, one fisherman who was going real slow, uh, he stopped, he shut off his motor, and we, we cajoled and called, and we, we did everything to try to get him to come. And he sat there for about 15 minutes, and he, uh, he did finally uh, come closer, but he wouldn't come to the shore. I guess he was afraid that the man might still be around. He said he'd go get help. So I got encouraged her enough to get me untied, and uh, I got one wrist loose so that I could get the rest untied. How were you finally? <clears throat> how were you finally found? Well, she was found down on the blanket still. I I would made it up about uh, 300 yards up up almost to the road, and I it was a slow process because I kept black. I couldn't see, you know. I kept blacking out. And my legs kept getting weak, but I was getting progress. I I think I could have made it to the road. But a, a, a pickup truck was coming along with these dirt roads, and apparently this man had called for help. Such a change in crime. He was clearly evolving and getting, let's be honest, much worse. I've had 11 years 
patrol on this lake, and I've seen a lot of people cut up by boat accidents and this, but this is one of the worst things I ever witnessed uh, for no reason at all. Just a hooded man came up with a pistol drawn on him, tied him up, and then told him he had to kill him. So, so there had been this theory that park ranger Dennis Land um, was somehow involved in this. And his activities and his actions during and after the crime are definitely cause for suspicion. Now, there is a person we know was present at the crime scene that day. We know he followed the victims to where they parked their car. We know that he tampered with evidence at the crime scene. And then he happens to match the description of the killer pretty closely. Brian Hartnell said that his first impression of this man was that the killer had come back. That turned out to be park ranger Dennis Land. And while waiting for detectives from the sheriff's department to arrive, Deputy Land talked to the witnesses that were there and obtained statements from them. I began a search for evidence. Dennis Land had taken that with him back to the park ranger station. As a professional investigator, I can't explain why any trained officer would touch a crime scene. I interviewed the, the officers that was there. One was a park ranger by the name of Dennis Land, and the other one was a park ranger by the name of uh, William White, Bill White, sergeant. And uh, at that time, uh, Bill White turned over to me uh, some of the articles that were found at the crime scene. Uh, didn't really make me too happy at the time because I couldn't actually go to the crime scene because someone uh, thinking they were doing the good, the good thing and the right thing by protecting it actually bundled up the blanket and the clothing and, and stuff that was there and, uh, and took it into his custody at uh, Berryessa Lake Park headquarters. Uh, he thought at the time he was doing a very good thing but at the same time it took us away from the opportunity to actually view the crime scene. So. Uh, put it in a few simple words, there wasn't really a crime scene to view. <laughs> and records of calls between the station and Dennis Land. At 6.13 p.m., he radioed into the dispatcher that he was going to go 10-7. He was going to go out of radio contact and go check the marina. And 10-8 would mean that he was back in radio contact, which is procedure. But Land never radios at 10-8, so there's a missing time gap of roughly 47 minutes until they get a report of the stabbing at 7 p.m. One crucial piece of evidence that was found during this was a very unique boot print. And discovered a footprint that led from Berryessa and Oxville Road to the victims and back again, which was totally separate from the, uh, the shoes that they were wearing. And it, it was determined to be uh, what was referred to as a wing walker shoe that was used primarily with the Navy and the Air Force uh, in maintenance due to the static free sole in the shoe. So the maintenance people could walk around the wings of aircraft without creating uh, static electricity. So we thought that was a very crucial piece of evidence. Well, the pictures are in the paper, this last one that they put out. I think it's probably as accurate as any that they have put up. He was uh, of medium to short height, uh, kind of uh, pouchy, uh, real casually, casual, I don't want to say sloppily, but casually, real casually dressed, uh, of course real dusty from the, uh, the lake, and he had this black hood on, came clear down to here, just little slits in the eyes, and where, you know, these clip-on glasses, they were clipped into those little uh, loops. One thing that's baffling is if you're going to kill somebody, you normally don't wear a mask, because you, you got it in your own mind you're going to kill them, so why do you have to hide your identity? So that's always been a puzzling matter in this case. Why did the Zodiac go through such a, a, a effort to, to make this mask to horrify people if he knew he was going to kill them? But very quickly, there was some clear and evident links that would tie this right back to the prior Zodiac killings. 7.40 p.m., uh, Officer Slate at the Napa Police Department received this call. Our switchboard was the old cord type that you plug in when a call comes in. The phone rang, and I recall saying, Officer Slate, Napa Police Department. There was a male voice on the other end of the phone, and he said, I want to report a murder. A double murder. They are two miles north of Park Headquarters. They were in a white 
Volkswagen Carpet Gear. I'm the one that did it. The call to Napa police came within an hour after the stabbings. A young man's voice reported the double murder. He described the couple, their car, the scene, and hung up. And then the dispatcher knew that the phone was not hung up. It just went silent. And uh, just minutes later, one of the officers said that he had discovered a phone off the hook at, the, at this car wash, which was only uh, five or six blocks from the Napa Police Department. My first thought was the ranger that had found these young people had stopped someone and said, I can't get out on my radio. Would you get to a phone and call and let someone know that what's going on? While that call was terrifying, for me it does do one thing, and that is assuade the idea that this could have been Dennis Land um, because he was at the crime scene with the detectives when that call was placed, um, and therefore I don't think he could have done it. You could get around that by saying perhaps these killings are done by two people, um, but for me it, it kind of assuades me away from the idea that Dennis Land had any involvement personally. I saw the white Carmen Gia and I saw tracks leading away from it, which we felt uh, may have been tire tracks from the Zodiac's vehicle. The two front tires were different, uh, which is unusual. Most people buy a set of tires, or at least uh, in pairs, but we here we had two tires that were distinctively different on the front of this vehicle, which kind of led us to believe it was an older model car uh, by someone that probably couldn't afford to keep up the the maintenance on the vehicle. I looked on the passenger door, the circle with the vertical and horizontal line running through it was displayed on the door and there were several dates and then it ended with uh, September 27th, 1969, 6.30 p.m. by knife, which was our crime. It was like an artist signing his work. Using a felt marker, he writes the dates of all three of his attacks, the method of his latest crime, and his ominous trademark. It was essentially snubbing his nose at law enforcement and basically telling others that, hey, I've been here, I can do what I want, I can do it as often as I want, and there's nothing you can do about it. Pretty thin point. You can see a little OCD, though, with the, the circles being filled in on the time. You know, if you're in a hurry, you wouldn't do that. He was into time. You know, he's continually in the telling us how far something is, what, how long it's been. He's very specific. Except this right here is the only thing that really nails down, you know, with some degree of authenticity, we think, the connection between the pieces. Oh, I agree with you. The killer was evolving. He was getting more brutal. This time he actually talked to the victims, he was experimenting, he was getting far more brutal. This was becoming a big issue um, for the local area. There is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a definite pattern between their killings and ours. And uh, the message left on the side of the victim's door uh, with the dates of the Solano County murders and ours, uh, along with other items that are on there, have definitely indicated to us that uh, they're one and the same. Does it seem to you as if uh, you're pretty much on the verge of finding this man? Well, I wouldn't want to say that, uh, Dave. Uh, we're hoping. Uh, we've, we've got some good things working for us, but it takes time. Mm -hmm. And to be able to reach out and pluck this guy out of the air isn't done. Uh, uh, in most murder cases, you'll find a motive. But of course, this guy is just a killer, uh, a mad killer, and you have no motive. So it makes it a little bit harder for us to track him down. In early October, the police interviewed a man who would go on to become the most famous suspect in this case, and the man that I think Toski and Graysmith very, very quickly uh, set their focus on to, and they still are fairly certain that this is the guy who did it. There's a retired homicide investigator in Vallejo, California, who thinks he knows who the killer is. His name is Jack Mullinex, 
18 years ago, when he was a homicide detective, he was assigned a case involving the Zodiac. What was your feeling once you got uh, once you got close to him? Did you feel stronger that he was the guy? Or? I did. I mean, did. I, I, I had uh, the only of all the people that I was uh, involved in investigating in the Zodiac. He was the only one that really, really turned me on. Where is he now? Do you know? The last I heard, he's working in a hardware store in Northern California. His name is Robert Graysmith, and this man has spent ten years researching the Zodiac before he wrote a book on it. He said, I'm Zodiac. And he didn't say, I'm the Zodiac. He said, I'm Zodiac. I can kill these people, and I can kill people and take credit for it. A school teacher named Arthur Lee Allen. Graysmith has painstakingly compiled a mountain of circumstantial evidence over the years, including witnesses who place Allen at or near every Zodiac murder scene. To know about Zodiac before there was a Zodiac, to use the symbol, to wear that watch, and, uh, and to be at the crime scenes and to know the victims, he would have to be Zodiac. Now, there are a lot of strange uh, theories and things, but it fits one man, it fits one man only. He liked a children's world. He, he liked kids. He liked to be a part of that world. He went a little too far with it, obviously. But he enjoyed children, and they loved him. And later I found out he was really arrested for, he really was fired for child molestation. As far as I can tell, Alan seems to be the best suspect that come up with. Because there was no evidence, Robert. What do you mean there's no evidence? You have him seen with the ciphers, the military boot prints, the same size shoes and gloves, the most dangerous game, the Zodiac watch, the background of school children, the, the misspellings of Christmas, the bloody knife. All circumstantial. And Arthur Lee Allen's choice of very specific boots would also add suspicion to his character in this case. And it, it was determined to be uh, what was referred to as a wing walker shoe that was used primarily with the Navy and the Air Force uh, in maintenance due to the static free sole in the shoe. Uh, our suspect wears them. It's not just that. He's a size 10 and a half. The shoes that were pressed into the dry sand of Lake Berryessa, size 10 and a half. After I came in, he showed me the watch, and he was in the process of writing thank you notes and, um, you know, putting, stuffing them in envelopes and that. And he had a box of stationary items on the table that was handy. He says, why don't you stamp some of those envelopes for me? So I did that. Uh, I can provide a service for your friends uh, and uh, then take take the heat off of you guys. And and what are you uh, talking about? Well, I can, you know, there's things I could do up to and including killing someone. You know, there was more to Arthur Lee Allman they met the eye. Uh, I felt that San Francisco, after they served a search warrant in Sonoma, uh, maybe should have looked at him a little harder. I'm not trying to say anything disparaging about them, but it just seemed like he was more of a viable suspect than they looked at at that time. Personally, I don't think Arthur Lee Allen looked like the sketches in any way. In fact, one of the sketches definitely looks more like me, I think, than Arthur Lee Allen. Um, but that could be explained away very, very quickly. I look like the description passed out only when I do my thing. The rest of the time, I look entirely different. A couple of years before the Lake Herman, Blue Rock Springs and, and Lake Berryessa murders back in 1966, there was another case that would eventually end up being very much tied to the Zodiac case, and that was a case that took place in Riverside. Sherry Jo Bates was stabbed to death, um, nearly decapitated by her killer. She was an athletic girl, a strong girl who was able to fight back. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't fight off her killer, um, but she did manage to knock his wristwatch off, which was found by the police, um, and it was splattered with white paint. Um, which perhaps would allude to the job of uh, the killer at the time. This was the only, at the time at least, unsolved murder in Riverside history. And six months later, the police received a letter um, from supposedly the killer outlining what he had done um, and taking credit for it. There was a few reasons why this letter would later be tied to the Zodiac, not least 
because it was signed off with the letter Z. Um, but some instances in it. At one point in the letter, he said, I then finished the job by cutting her throat. I am not sick, I am insane, but that will not stop the game. The fact that he put the game in there obviously was later linked to the fact that he talked about the dangerous game in later letters. But the Z was obviously the big thing that was brought up. But that connection wasn't made until four years later by Paul Avery. Six months later, there are other, there are other things that make me think that uh, uh, it's quite possibly him. Uh, I received a letter from an individual in Southern California pointing out the similarities. Actually, it was an anonymous letter, uh, and I, I felt that there might be something to it, so I contacted the Riverside Police. Uh, they were very cooperative, gave me information on the phone, and then sent me some information, Xerox copies of certain documents. And then they included, kind of as an aside, a letter uh, that had been received six months after the Riverside girl had been killed and said, this might be of interest to you, uh, uh, it's signed with a Z. In 2016, according to, I believe, the FBI, someone had called in um, to a police department or somewhere and basically said that, look, that was a prank, I wrote that letter. If that is the case, it was in really, really poor taste, um, but that would essentially assuade the idea that it was linked to the Zodiac in any way. And there was another case that very much lines up with uh, similarities to the Zodiac case, and that was the 1962 killing of Ray Davis, who was a cab driver, and letters also appeared after that murder. But personally, I think the Ray Davis killing was very much only linked to the Zodiac because of what would happen next in San Francisco after Lake Berryessa. This has always been known as a city of mystery, and it seems now to have a new and real one on its hands. Five murders, and somebody who says he committed all and will commit yet more. The latest, a taxi driver in San Francisco. Came here to San Francisco to commit a deliberate murder so that he might garner that attention that had remained so elusive. And with the murder of Paul Stein, he gained that notoriety driver for Yellow Cab in San Francisco had picked up a fare in downtown San Francisco and somewhere en route to the Sunset District, uh, the fare asked him to stop at a certain location and uh, at that time the, uh, the Zodiac killer had, had shot the cab driver. Zodiac, this is a real departure from his previous assaults. Before this, he ambushes only young couples on remote lovers' lanes in the suburbs. This time, he kills a lone cab driver in a wealthy neighborhood in the big city, trying to prove, it seems, that he can kill anyone, anywhere. The description that came out over the air was of an NMA, Negro male adult at the time. Um, the only person that could have given that information would have been the child who called it into police dispatch. What did you see when you came down this road? My headlights went on to an individual who was walking in the shadow of the trees at the time. The individual I saw that night was a white male adult, approximately 35 to 45 years of age, 5 feet 10 inches tall, 180 to 210 pounds. Fortunately, uh, as I was told, um, they were looking for a black man. They had been given wrong information on the phone. Since we were looking for a Negro male adult, we proceeded on Jackson Street towards Arguello, continuing our search. And continued on. Moments later, Fox Radio corrects the description, but by then, the suspect has disappeared. As we arrived at Arguello Street, the description of the suspect was changed to a white male adult, believing that this suspect was possibly the one involved in the shooting we entered the Presidio of San Francisco and conducted a search on West Pacific Avenue, the opposite side of the wall, the last direction that we observed the suspect going. Did not find the suspect. Vak was also very clear as to what the person was wearing. 
Well, it just so happens that area is extremely well lit, and I cannot imagine his not seeing the shine of blood on the clothing if it had been Zodiac. I feel bad for him if he believes that was the Zodiac. I don't think it was. He claimed later in a letter that he had been watching the whole time. Finding one psychopath in this city could be a tall order. This latest communication from the killer who calls himself Zodiac adds very little substantially to the case, except that he may be a conservationist. Ed Leslie, News 13, San Francisco. It very much seems like he only committed this murder to prove a point, just to get the bloody cloth that he later sent in to the newspapers from Paul Stein's shirt. Police are now convinced that it was the killer of a San Francisco cab driver who sent in a swatch of bloody cloth with a letter to the San Francisco Chronicle. And uh, two days later, the Chronicle, where I worked then, uh, received uh, a letter from the Zodiac. The, uh, the envelope was opened, it was addressed to the uh, editor, and it was like a letter to the editor. And the uh, secretary uh, who handled that correspondence opened the envelope, uh, saw this bloody, blood-stained shirt, and read the letter and rushed it into the executives uh, at the paper. Over the next several weeks, Zodiac sends two more swatches of the bloody shirt along with letters taunting the police for failing to catch him. And he confirms that he was spotted that night by Officer Fount. I do feel I have second-guessed myself that night. That you should have stopped him? Should have stopped and talked to him. Well, as you can see, the shirt is blood-stained. Um, and what appears happened is that the backside, what would be the tail of this shirt, has been cut out. Incredibly, the Zodiac lingers here at the murder scene for quite a while, collecting his trophies, the cab driver's wallet, his ID. He then calmly walks up Cherry Street. Little does he know that just around the corner, a police squad car is approaching. All of the letters sent by the killer have been posted from San Francisco, and police believe the man either works or lives in the city. Laboratory tests on the cloth torn from the shirt of Paul Stein prove that it came, in fact, from the cab driver when he was murdered last Saturday night in Presidio Heights. And handwriting analysis of a foreboding letter indicates the writer is the same man who's committed five murders, one here, three in Vallejo, and one in Napa over the last 10 months. His chilling allusions to future slayings are being counted with an intense drive to prevent him from fulfilling any promises. Dick Carlson reporting for Newsbeat from San Francisco Hall of Justice. There has also since been suspicion that the Zodiac could live very close by, given the fact that, according to one of his later letters, he was watching the entire thing unfold afterwards as the police were running around looking for him. You know, if you have a suspect who's living in a house overlooking the crime scene or the search area, then this person can both view the search and also be totally uh, immune from being captured because he's watching from the, the comfort of his own living room, basically. In his letters, Zodiac taunts police while admitting that he did remain near the murder scene, watching the police search from the safety of a hiding place. I enjoy needling the blue pigs. Hey, blue pig, the dogs never came within two blocks of me, and they were to the west. The motorcycles went by about 150 feet away. Nearly 50 years after the first murder, there was still a big push to try and break the codes. They couldn't crack them. The CIA had tried, the FBI had tried, various code breakers had tried. They were eluded by these. Um, and these were two codes in general, Z13 because of 13 characters and likewise Z340. The Z13 in 2017 was thought to have been broken. Apparently, once the Z13 code was broken, the shorter of the two, it alleged that the name of the person was Kane, K-A-N-E. The FBI, though, very much had their doubts about this and the accuracy of that code break. And the problem with cryptography and encryption and so on is it's very hard to verify something with a small subset. Realistically, 
it's much easier to verify something long like the 340 code than it is with the 13 code because you don't have much to compare it to, to check whether the rest is gibberish. So the FBI still weren't 100% sure that the Kane finding was actually accurate. Back in the late 60s though, while the police were still trying to crack these codes and hunt the killer, things were going from bad to monumentally worse. School children make fine targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning, just shoot out the front tire, and then pick off the kiddies as they come bouncing out. That was the threat of the Zodiac Killer. Now, every day, police cars follow the buses which would be likely targets. Officers armed with shotguns take the threat seriously. The new threat leaves families with school children in fear. Many parents start driving their kids. Police cruisers escort school buses. Suddenly, um, everyone in town wants this thing solved, and they want it solved yesterday. In San Francisco, we have been since the first day, since the reception of this note, and up to now and continuing, we have a number of plain clothes officers following buses in the morning and in the evening. Uh, you know, if somebody shoots out your tire, don't stop, keep driving. Uh, so there was a, a great panic. As you can imagine, there was immense pressure on the police to ensure that nothing happened and to get on top of this as quickly as possible. And I think even the word immense there is probably the understatement of the century. The bus patrol started first in this county Wednesday. Police units from various agencies using marked and unmarked cars follow buses on their runs to and from schools. Assisted by aerial patrols and some buses now equipped with two-way police radios, the massive patrols are responses to the Zodiac Killer's threat to stop a bus and shoot children. The patrols are concentrated in the remote sections of the county, similar to areas where five were murdered. The Napa School District is the third largest in the state in busing. Its 70 buses travel more than 4,000 miles a day. These patrols have been expanded to several counties, and the Highway Patrol has written guidelines for bus drivers. We have uh, specifically requested that they re alert their drivers to uh, not stop under any conditions if a uh, shot is fired or if their bus is subjected to a flat tire by the sniper. Further, that they get the children down immediately and proceed with all speed out of the area and uh, to try and attract uh, all the possible attention by blowing their horns, uh, and therefore get out of the situation. Uh, we're satisfied that it is all that can reasonably be done under the circumstances that might be present at the particular time, giving due consideration to the vast number of buses operating. Have any of the drivers uh, expressed any concern over their job now? Well, uh, there's naturally talk. Everybody's, I guess, tense about it, but they all seem to be in good spirits and all seem to be going on with the job. I don't know of anybody that's quit. You're not afraid? No, I'm not. No, I'm not, afraid not, that uh, not too afraid. <laughs> on top of all of this, even worse, there was then a bomb threat thrown in on top of a potential sniper situation. If you do not want me to have this blast, you must do two things. Tell everyone about the bus bomb and all the details. I would like to see some nice Zodiac buttons wandering about town, on the face of which uh, says, I hope you enjoy yourselves when I have my blast. The killer sent a diagram for an explosive device that was in the hillsides around Napa. And this was working on an electric eye system where everything else could pass, but a school bus would set this bomb off. Bomb, as he described it to us in the past, consists of a bomb planted in the street or alongside of a roadside, which would uh, be triggered when a school bus passed by. Uh, he's an absolutely ruthless, completely merciless killer. He doesn't get great excitement over it. He's, he just uh, he thinks killing is, is just killing. So somebody like that is going to be a very serious problem for us. Uh, what more do you know about the killer today than you did earlier? Well, we have uh, 
progressed. Uh, we've been able to uh, come up with more physical evidence uh, that uh, will be able to be used in, in court. Uh, what we have to do is find the suspect, of course, and be able to apply those. I think this man is a, uh, a psychopath with uh, very, very seriously mentally deranged. Uh, he appears to have no conscience at all, no remorse after any of the acts, certainly no reason or even alleged justification for anything that he does. Um, several of the shootings have occurred without a single word to anybody, just merely to walk up and, and start shooting. This man is a a serious problem to us. He's a very, very sick and very dangerous person. Thankfully though, another letter would arrive and for the first time, police were relieved to get a letter from the Zodiac. After last month's letters and the murder of a cab driver, the Zodiac threatened to kill children on a school bus. So bus guards were provided in many Bay Area counties, including these at Napa. Police say most of those precautions have been halted and now, in the latest letter, the Zodiac says, if you cops think I'm going to take on a bus the way I stated I was, you deserve to have holes in your heads. Sadly, though, throughout all of this, uh, police were no closer to catching the Zodiac killer. Are you confident you will get him sooner or later? Well, of course, that's, uh, I feel that about all the murders we're involved in. I mean, that's our business and that's our job, and, uh, and uh, that's the only way to look at it and approach it is that, uh, of course, eventually we'll get him. I'm standing in front of the Vallejo home, which investigators searched last Valentine's Day, the home of the man police have suspected off and on for the last 20 years. Thousands of people have been interviewed, and the Zodiacs bounced in and out of the news. And through it all, there's been one constant, Arthur Allen. I'm not the Zodiac killer. I feel that there are so many areas that point directly at Arthur Lee Allen that I feel that he is a viable suspect and in all probability the Zodiac. In 1991, there was a break in the case when a tip came in to one of the case detectives still working on this. Why did Arthur Lee Allen become prominent again in 1989? Well, we had, had a couple of reasons. Uh, primary was that, uh, that a guy named Ralph Spinelli came forward, and Ralph Spinelli, I knew him well. He was a, uh, uh, about my age and a small time crook from, from Vallejo. To make things even more exciting for the police, Mike Majo, one of the survivors of the Zodiac killings, was able to ID a suspect. I gave him this set of pictures. He looked at it for about 20 seconds and he said, pointed to Arthur Lee Allen and said, that's him, that's the man that shot me. Uh, that is mine, but uh, that's my third Carmen Guia. Oh, your third Carmen? According to the affidavit unsealed by a judge late this afternoon, an armed robbery suspect arrested in San Jose last December told police there that Arthur Allen, now 52 years old, is the infamous Zodiac. That information led Vallejo police to obtain a warrant and search Allen's home last Valentine's Day. Police were looking for specific items, 22 caliber pistols, a black executioner style hood, yellow taxi cab keys. Without revealing everything they found, I learned they did confiscate explosives. Bombs exactly like those the Zodiac serial killer described during his murder spree in the late 1960s and early to mid-1970s. Arthur Lee Allen died just months after this and was never formally arrested or formally a suspect in the case. So if we're going to evaluate someone like Arthur Lee Allen, we have to consider all the ways he doesn't match the 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 profile of the Zodiac or the evidence um, pointing towards the Zodiac. The Zodiac, I believe, was a heterosexual male who was attracted to age-appropriate women. And Mr. Allen, is my understanding, was preferred children. Since his death, though, there was continued intrigue into him as a suspect, and this meant that as the 90s moved on and into the 2000s, new DNA and forensic technology allowed investigators to, with more certainty, decide whether or not Alan was in fact the right suspect for the case, whether or not he was the Zodiac. We're hoping to be able to get some genetic information about 
the individual or individuals that did seal these envelopes or place stamps on them. To produce a genetic profile, it needs just 50 human cells. Next, Dr. Holt compares the partial profile from the Zodiac letter to a DNA sample from Bay Area school teacher Arthur Lee Allen along the top there. You can see the they're distinctly different. Well, based on the, the information that I developed, um, the Arthur Lee Allen could not have contributed the DNA that I detected on the stamp. It did not match the partial profile that we developed. Arthur Lee Allen did not donate the biological material that was recovered from the stamp. When you write, you, you rest the heel of your palm, a very characteristic part of it, on the paper. And people in those days weren't really aware that you could leave a palm print and that it could be identified. They knew about fingerprints. It was compared to the one that had been developed earlier, and they don't match. That is not Arthur Allen's palm print. It seems then, at least according to any hard evidence, that Arthur Lee Allen did not commit the Zodiac killings. It seems like the only evidence left is circumstantial, and under today's burden, that just wouldn't be enough, given the fact that there's no DNA evidence and DNA evidence from the letters and so on exists that would point to the fact that it just isn't Arthur Lee Allen. And during an interview here last Friday night with Channel 7 News, Arthur Allen claimed that he is being persecuted by Vallejo police. And Arthur Lee Allen would go on until his dying breath, adamant that he wasn't the Zodiac killer. Two types of liars in the world, fishermen and policemen, and not necessarily in that order. And their function is lying to you is to trip you up. They can't do it to me because I have nothing to trip over. No, I'm certainly, most certainly not the Zodiac killer. They haven't arrested me be because they can't prove a thing. I'm not the damn Zodiac. Thank God for our Constitution because that says a person is innocent until proven guilty. Difficult as hell and it can be ex It could be terribly depressing. And if I deserved any of it, that would be something different, but I don't. Michael Finney, Channel 7 News, tonight. So the issue for me personally with Arthur Lee Allen is not the fact that I don't think he's a good suspect. He clearly is not a great person, given he was charged with child molestation, as far as I'm aware. It's the fact that we had a living victim, a survivor, who was able to be used at various points to check the voice um, of the Zodiac Killer against the voice he heard. And at no point, as far as I'm aware, did Brian Hartnell ever point to Arthur Lee Allen as sounding exactly like the man who stabbed him. So that for me was the, the point where, that for me was the indication that I don't think Arthur Lee Allen did it, or at least he didn't commit the Lake Berryessa stabbings. I'd like to tell you about a, a, somebody a little different from this, this dark figure, this maniacal killer that, uh, uh, that seems to come across. He was a bright, interesting guy with a good sense of humor. My mother liked him, my wife liked him, all my kids liked him. but. He was not only left-handed, literally, but figuratively, too. He reminded me, when he was younger at least, of, um, of the young man in uh, Catcher in the Rye. Uh, he, he was well-meaning, screw-up. Uh, he, could, he could find more ways to, to mess up his life than anybody I ever met. But this is an even bigger problem, isn't it, for the police? Because if not Arthur Lee Allen after all these years, then who? He was the madman who called himself the Zodiac Killer. And this is the surviving victim who looked him straight in the eye and says she knows who the killer is. Uh, Kathleen Johns was a woman that was uh, down in, in, in Central California. It was late at night. I had left in the evening. And the car behind me started flashing its lights, bright and dim, bright and dim. And the car pulled up behind me, and 
this guy got out and he um, said that my back wheel was wobbly. Uh, the wheel looks like it's not on good. And she claimed that uh, somebody pulled next to her and said her tire was about to fall off. And then that person took her and her child from her car into their car, drove them around, scared her. When we would come to any kind of stop sign, he would slow down, but he didn't stop. So I jumped finally. Her and man in the field. She was able to jump out on a freeway overpass or, or entrance lane or something and hide from this person and ultimately went to the Patterson Police Department. Just wait and see what happens. You no, know, he could have stopped at any time and physically been stronger than I was. I was like seven months pregnant and I had a little kid on my lap. She was seven months pregnant with an infant child in her arms and managed to jump from the car and survive um, while it was moving. Terrifying stuff. Terrifying stuff. But now, one determined cop says he knows exactly who the killer is and where he's hiding. Doug Bruckner has the story. She did offer up a clue to the investigators, though. A very, very interesting one. He says it's her eyewitness account that proves his suspect is, in fact, the Zodiac. Detective Harvey Hines of Escalon says his analysis of these cryptic symbols reveals the Zodiac's name is Cain. We also have another clue. He installed another clue in the, in the uh, cryptogram. It reads name Cain or name Cain, C -A -N -E, reading from right to left. She saw him and put her finger down on the picture and said that was him. And she said, it's not only my eyes telling me, it's my stomach too. Indeed, there is a man who used the name Cain, who has a criminal record, who was born in 1924. He's an ex-mental patient who fits the profile of the Zodiac Killer. The man called Cain now lives in rural Northern California, but he hasn't been arrested. Later, he would be linked to another crime where Donna Lass, an employee in a hotel where Cain worked in Lake Tahoe, went missing and was never seen again. And she was seen last in that area. And a postcard supposedly from Zodiac was sent later on from that area, from Forest Pines. The limit of my knowledge about the girl at Lake Tahoe, and we discussed that at the time uh, that we were talking during the investigation of Benali, uh, is that she was a nurse, uh, that she got off duty at a, a casino up there, and uh, ostensibly that's the last time anybody saw her. And the similarity between that and Judith Akari is that uh, Miss Akari was a nurse, and uh, uh, within reason she got off duty. She was followed by a fellow employee to a certain you know, location, and she was never seen again. I understand there was also a similarity in the way the parked cars were found. Now, uh, the car in the, in the uh, girl in Lake Tahoe was apparently found, and I just learned that today, it was apparently found in her parking stall in front of her apartment or her cabin or wherever she, her place of residence was. And uh, Miss Akari's automobile was found in its parking spot in front of uh, her apartment. And there is a link between the Riverside case and the Kathleen Johns case. And that is the fact that in the Riverside case, the killer did actually disable her Volkswagen Beetle by removing the distributor coil and the condenser so that the car wouldn't start. And then according to a later letter, if it is to be believed, and according to police in general, it seems likely that the killer offered her help to get to wherever she was going and that's how he got her in the car. And this was similar to the Kathleen Johns case where he decided to help with the wheel, but then went and loosened the wheel. There was never enough evidence though to either tie this to Zodiac or on Kane in general, and Kane was never treated as a official police suspect of the case in either situation. One of the most bizarre parts of this case, though, is definitely the call-in show. Zodiac, a symbol that now stands for terror in San Francisco. Today, there was a possibly significant development in the terrifying case of the man who calls himself Zodiac. Uh, Inspector Attorney Melvin Belli's office has said that uh, it has been contacted by a person claiming to be the Zodiac. Have you been able to verify that the letter received by his office is authentic? Yes, we have. This has been done by our crime lab. Mm -hmm. Basically, it was a letter written to Mr. Belli, which was a personal type letter, and again, uh, at this point of the investigation, I 
would not want to comment on the uh, particular details of the contents of this letter. This bizarre situation began at 2 o'clock this morning when the so-called Zodiac telephoned police headquarters. He said he was sick, he needed help, and he wanted to talk to Belli on television. All the scheduled guests were canceled from the show on the ABC station KGO. Belli waited for Zodiac to call on the private line. The phone was not tapped. The killer telephoned 12 times. He spoke very little with attorney Belli trying to draw him out. Just tell us what's going on in, in, inside you right now, please. I have headache. There was one moment when he talked about killing kids that I still remember with a shiver. I want to kill those kids. He calls back 11 times. How long have you had those headaches, Sam? It's been a long time since I killed a kid. Talk to us. Just tell us what's going on in, in, inside you right now, Sam. Please. I have headaches. Right. Did, were you in service that you might have had the... An injury in service. Did you ever fall out of a tree or downstairs? Were you ever unconscious? I don't know. You don't remember. So no one knows yet if they had the Zodiac Killer on the phone. They'll have witnesses listen to a tape of the broadcast to determine that. But it seems that a solution to the five Zodiac murders is just as far away as it was before. Spencer Michaels, KCRA News, San Francisco. The supposed Zodiac afterwards even offered to meet up, um, but never showed. Bill I finally arranged to meet Zodiac in Daly City, a suburb south of San Francisco, to talk in person. The attorney waited in an office building, but Zodiac never showed. I asked Bill I if he thought the man who called really was the Zodiac killer. I can't. Negative. I, I, I can't say. All I can say is this man needed help. This man seemed like a man who was coming up to a storm or to a climax. And, this very blood-curdling thing. Children kill, and then the sort of an agonized uh, cutoff, and enough to turn your hair whiter than mine. So inside the thrift shop, St. Vincent de Paul, attorney Melvin Belli and the San Francisco police waited for the Zodiac killer. The man did not show, so now all we can do is wait perhaps for that next phone call from the man who calls himself Zodiac, who has killed five and says he's going to kill again. Dick Shoemaker, ABC News, San Francisco. Nothing came of that. We went out to the location where the meet was to have been. Mr. Belli was out there, Mr. Dunbar was out there, and nobody appeared. Can you tell us where that was? That was in the, uh, a little out of San Francisco, in the outer end of the Mission District. Do you explain that he was the Zodiac with all that program this morning? Not necessarily. I listened to the program. My opinion, my, for what it's worth, my, my opinion is that this is no hoaxer, no prankster. The man on that show, I sincerely believe, has a problem, has a mental problem, but he may or may not have been the so-called Zodiac person. I hope you're having lots of fun in trying to catch me. That's part of the chilling taunt from one of the Bay Area's most notorious serial killers, now decoded after 51 years. A major break in the case came in 2021, when the Z340 cipher was finally cracked. This major development in the case comes decades after that coded message was sent to the San Francisco Chronicle in November of 1969, and many hope it will help identify the serial killer. A coded 340 character message sent to the San Francisco Chronicle from the infamous Zodiac killer of the 1960s, cracked by a group of amateur code breakers. In a statement, the Bureau said the FBI is aware that a cipher attributed to the Zodiac killer was recently solved by private citizens. We, we tried several hundred thousand incorrect ways of solving the cipher, and just by chance we happened to sort of stumble upon a fragment of, of how it could be solved. And using that fragment, we reverse engineered the, the entire solution and uh, got the, the entire message out from the Zodiac. Sadly, though, there was no name to be found in this cipher. Fagan said there had been hope that the killer would reveal his identity in one of his coded messages. This one didn't do the trick. It doesn't reveal his identity. It doesn't give a lot of clues to his identity. I think more what it does is the, the method that he was able to use to create that, uh, that cipher um, may help uh, track down who he is. That The Zodiac was encrypting is replaced with multiple symbols. It did, though, confirm what Brian Hartnell had said years and years ago, 
that the voice who called in to the Jim Dunbar show wasn't in fact the killer. And in the cipher it said it wasn't me on the TV show. At one point in time, I was asked to go down and listen to a tape uh, of an interview that had been on the Jim Dunbar show. And uh, if I recall correctly, uh, Melvin Bell, I was asked to come to the Jim Dunbar show. And so uh, I was asked to listen to the voice. And there was some interaction between uh, uh, Melvin Bell, I and Jim Dunbar. My recollection of that voice is it wasn't that wasn't even in the in the range of, of, of what I'd heard. I think I told him that I didn't think that was the voice. After no new letters, contact or information since 1974, police finally got another break in the case with a letter sent in by the supposed Zodiac in 1978. This letter from the Zodiac poses more questions than it answers. Questions like, why has he only communicated twice in the past nine years? Has he killed in that time? No clues in the latest letter. But more importantly, who is the Zodiac and where is he? Every time the Zodiac would send us a letter, uh, we were spurred on because we gleaned a little bit of uh, intelligence information out of every letter that he sent us. And uh, we just hoped that uh, we could latch on to one little thing that might might lead us to the, the Zodiac Killer. We knew an awful lot about this, uh, this killer. But in 1978, April 25th, I believe, uh, we got a letter that says, I am back with you. I've never been anywhere else. You know, I've been with you all this time. San Francisco police displayed a blackboard with excerpts of the latest Zodiac letter at a news conference last night. Police are convinced it's authentic. Deputy San Francisco Police Chief Clem D'Amica said it's the 16th letter received from the Zodiac Killer. However, there was more to this 1978 letter than meets the eye. Towards the end, uh, I don't know if we were getting some, some letters that uh, turned out not to be authentic Zodiac letters. And, and uh, I believe the last time we heard from him with an authenticated letter was in April of 1974. For the first time since the Zodiac case began nine years ago, Inspector Dave Toski is out of it. Toski is under fire for writing phony fan letters about himself to a newspaper feature writer, Armistad Mopan. And Mopan today came up with far more serious charges, that there are similarities between the letters Toski admits writing to Mopan and the most recent Zodiac letter of last April. And that was it. Toski was off the case and close to losing his career after being one of the most famous detectives only a decade earlier. Tosky admits writing the fan letters to Mopan, but vigorously denies having anything to do with the letters purporting to come from the killer known as Zodiac. Tosky was low profile at the Hall of Justice today. He had been officially reprimanded over the fan letters by being transferred from the homicide detail to the pawn shop detail. And an official investigation is underway on any connection he might have with the Zodiac letters. Thus far, the experts can't agree on the authenticity of the last letter from the Zodiac. Right now, Toski is admitted to nothing more than being guilty of an indiscretion. As technology moved forward, the case continued on in the background and investigators struggled to find more and more evidence. Thankfully though, technology also got better and they had more DNA at their disposal to either put more pressure on certain suspects or completely clear them from their list. Careful as he was, it's unlikely that 33 years ago, Zodiac would worry about leaving behind a genetic trail. Could this tiny strand bear Zodiac's DNA fingerprint? She examines it, but again, no luck. Now, you have a lot more to work with. It's gotta be exciting well the potential is exciting potential is higher now that we have um, three more envelopes several more stamps exciting because homicide inspector kelly carroll and his partner mike maloney can then compare it with dna samples from anyone suggested as a possible suspect something the original zodiac investigators could only have dreamed of from all of your investigations what can you tell us about the zodiac uh, not a great deal. Uh, he's not an un unintelligent man by a long shot. Uh, his paragraphing, his phrasing, his punctuation is very good. I'm sure he has deliberately misspelled words in an attempt to lead us to believe that he's illiterate, but uh, in so doing, why he's led us to the point that we 
believe just the opposite. Disappointment is followed quickly by a possible breakthrough. Remember that taunting greeting card? Dr. Holt gets a tentative result from the outside of the envelope that contained it. I can tell you that there is an indication that there may be DNA uh, from one of the stamps. You could well be on the trail of the Zodiac. Well, it, the prospect of being able to contribute to the story is exciting. Then, out of the blue, more good news for Dr. Holt. Our primetime investigation of the case leads to a major discovery. Three more Zodiac envelopes in mint condition. They quietly arrive at the lab after our inquiries with a retired police source. He had kept them in his personal files. And I think that after the Golden State Killer was caught in 2021, investigators more hope than ever that they could potentially do the same thing with Zodiac and catch him while he was alive. That bombshell arrest, that former police officer who authorities say went on a reign of terror for so many years. The numbers, as I mentioned, are simply staggering. At least 12 murders, 45 rapes. They say this is their man, Joseph D'Angelo, now 72, arrested outside his home. They surprised him. He spent years as a California police officer. He'd been married. Law enforcement now identifying 72-year-old Joseph James D'Angelo as the Golden State Killer. But D'Angelo not a suspect until days ago when they got a break. They say cutting edge DNA testing allowed them to make a match. Now though in 2023, as each year passes by, it becomes less and less likely that they'll catch this man alive. There may now be a break in this case though. A nonprofit group claims that it has identified the Zodiac Killer. A group of independent cold case investigators claims they have solved the more than 50 year old mystery of the Zodiac Killer. It is made up of former FBI agents, military officials and forensic investigators from all across the country, and they say they're confident they have solved this mystery. The case now, though, might finally be closer to being solved than it ever has before. But going to the library, that simple, and going through Bay Area phone books that put him in the Bay Area at the right times. And there was just no way you could get around it that it wasn't this person. Everything uh, matched up, including stuff that wasn't public that we had kind of found and talked. The long unsolved Zodiac Killer case and a high profile announcement putting a name to the suspect's face. It's no surprise for this Sacramento investigator and attorney. The group says Post had scars on his forehead from a car crash that matched scars on a sketch of the Zodiac. That is irrefutable. That is a mark that's the same. It's on him all the way to his death at 80 years old. The case breakers point to Gary Post, an Air Force veteran and house painter who died in 2018. We have uh, six people that he told towards his last years that he was the Zodiac. The group says evidence like a shoe size match, court affidavits, matching facial features, and a clue that the killer hid his name in those ciphers proves their ID. His name is Post. He ended it with the stamp, and they couldn't figure out his last name. He cleverly used the post markings as Gary Francis Stamp, post. And it's more than just the this little riddle or the code that was sent to the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, they have the scars, apparently, on you know post forehead that match the drawing of the Zodiac Killer. And they've even gone so far as to interview Post's neighbor who says that she believes that Post was the Zodiac Killer. So they've done an outstanding job, and it's interesting. First, uh, obviously, we, we dealt with Bob Durst after 40 years, and now more than 50 years, um, we're getting close to identifying the Zodiac Killer. Obviously, he's passed, but if it is indeed Post, he's not going to face, face the same justice that Bob Durst did. It's a good feeling, but there's there was a bit of, you know, sadness to it that we actually, when he was still alive, we're talking to individuals in law enforcement about, you know, we were confident it was him. Sacramento attorney Mark Reichel and his longtime investigator, John Kennedy, named Gary Post as the likely Zodiac killer years ago after their own lengthy investigation. This is the radar station where he worked. Kennedy showed me the digital files of his own Zodiac Killer investigation tied to Gary Post, compiling records where Post was stationed in the Air Force before the Zodiac Killer spree in the 50s. And in these places, there were encrypted messages being sent and received. 
and where Post may have picked up a knack for codes. Kennedy also found a news clipping of a deadly car crash Post was involved in just outside the base. So Mark Reichel and John Kennedy, while they believe that Post is in fact the Zodiac Killer, they do acknowledge that the evidence that they have is circumstantial. They look forward to the day that science will prove them right. Uh, uh, expert uh, like myself who has had contact with members within the bureau that said that since 2016 Gary Francis Post was their suspect. They will be releasing this evidence um, if and when the FBI confirms whether or not they are accurate using the database of evidence that the FBI has on this case. Some aren't convinced. I woke up this morning I really thought it was April 1st. Tom Voigt of ZodiacKiller.com calls the claims hot garbage and says the theories presented are thin. Who are we to say yay or nay? San Francisco Chronicle reporter Kevin Fagan's been covering the Zodiac case for years. He says he's not so sure Post is the right guy. You know, I got an email two weeks ago saying that uh, they found Herb Kane's name in the anagram, so Herb Kane must be the Zodiac. Uh, before that, it was Charlie Manson. Back in December, the FBI confirmed that a Zodiac cipher had been cracked by codebreakers. His message said in part, I hope you're having lots of fun and trying to catch me, and I'm not afraid of the gas chamber. Now, I did reach out to the San Francisco Police Department and the FBI, and they both told me that this case remains open. They have not confirmed the theory presented by the case breakers today, so at least for now, the mystery continues. Until then, we can only ponder. But I, for one, have always been of the opinion that this is most likely a gun for hire type. A man who was hired to commit murders on the behalf of others. And he cleverly used the letters to make this look like a serial killer instead of a, a gun for hire. The San Francisco police say the Zodiac case is still open, but it's not actively under investigation. In fact, many of the files in the case have been stored in Sacramento, and the original detectives in the case have retired. And I think given that that's been my opinion on it, that makes the idea of Post, who was a house painter, even more poetic. And then I started painting houses.